to the seventh webinar of the Cornea Club. We're very excited because after a short break, we're now back on and actually we have some amazing speakers from across the pond. And uh, before I introduce you to them, I'll just remind you that you can find our previous sessions on our website, uh, the Cornea Club, and also on the Facebook page and YouTube channel. And you can ask any questions through the Q&A button and we can uh, answer as time permits at the end. So our session today is complex cornea and anterior segment surgery, pearl jams, and we have uh, two amazing speakers and also a, a guest speaker, an extra guest speaker as well. Uh, so we have Mr. Nizar Dean, who will be moderating the session, and uh, Professor Joshua Takeman, and we also, also have Professor Aiki Ahmed. So it's a huge honor for us, and I'll just introduce uh, our uh, uh, expert speaker on cornea, Professor Joshua Takeman, who has a short bio for him, which you probably all know him, the cornea world obviously all know, knows him. So he uh, had his Bachelor of Science from Queen's University and earned his Doctor of Medicine from Western University. Amongst everything else he's done, he's uh, completed his surgical fellowship in cornea, external disease and anterior segment and refractive surgery at the University of Ottawa. He has received numerous awards from the American Academy and from the uh, American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons. Uh, he's at the moment running an amazing fellowship in the University of Toronto, and Mr. Nizardine is at the moment one of his fellows. So um, we, we know uh, Nizar because he's uh, one of the UK people, so we've met him before, but uh, for those of you who don't know him, uh, Nizar has uh, received two prestigious scholarships to study medicine at the Imperial College of London. He has completed his seven-year residency in the North Thames Deanery, and he's a fellow of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. He has done a fellowship in cornea and external disease at Moorfields Eye Hospital. And since 2020, he's uh, been chosen to be one of the two international fellows for the very distinguished and reputable cornea and refractive fellowship at the University of Toronto. Uh, he has an interest in publications, research, and in medical education. And he's done uh, humanitarian work in Jordan, Pakistan, and Syrian refugees. So, I will pass the word to Nizar to start presenting some cases and uh, then we will be hearing the discussion and uh, we'll invite all of you to participate in this. Thanks so much, Let me just share my screen. Okay, can you see it all? Yes, we can. Yes. Great, thank you so much. Well, firstly, thank you so much uh, for the kind invitation um, and for the very generous uh, introduction. Um, I remember as a first year resident in ophthalmology coming to the corneoplastic course at East Grinstead run by Ms. Hamada and back in the day, Shreya Zadaya. Um, and that really you know, spurned my enthusiasm in cornea. Uh, so in the next 45, 50 minutes, both myself, uh, Dr. Teichman, and, and hopefully even uh, Dr. Ahmed, we're going to share some of the pearls and tips and tricks that we've learned in cornea and complex anterior segment. So the title Pearl Jams is a bit of a play on words. Um, Mr. Hamada um, was very astute over the weekend. He, he realized that this is also a rock band and this is one of their covers in the back. And we do have two rock star surgeons amongst us, Dr. Teichman and Dr. Ahmed. Okay, so let's begin. So two cases. And feel free to drop any messages in the chat box uh, and I'm sure we can moderate. So the first case, this is a patient that was referred to us um, for superficial keratopathy and a decentered loose intraocular lens bag complex in the right eye. They had previous complex ophthalmic history. Um, in the right eye, had a previous past kind of vitrectomy due to an epiretinal membrane. And in the left eye, also had two vitrectomies, one for epiretinal membrane and one for macular hole repair, and then um, had cataract surgery subsequently. Person's uh, slit lamb examination demonstrates in the right eye a vision that is counting fingers, uh, microcystic corneal edema, decimate folds. The pupil was moderately dilated, um, and the lens had marked pseudopathy, which you'll see hopefully in during the uh, video. So the decent three piece I will back and a large summer ring present evidence of a repair 
Left side was largely unremarkable, except for a pass plana uh, vitrectomy and macular atrophy. So what options do we have? With the guided prognosis of the retina, we could simply observe it you know, in a discussion with the patient if they would prefer. Or we could proceed with medical treatment. So Mural 128 won't obviously improve the vision. It may provide comfort, but even then, you know, that would be pretty slim. So our own will only really options that we have are surgical. So we could do a standalone DMEC, standalone DSEC, or a sequential or combined um, endolamellar keratoplast with an improper lens exchange. So with any particular plan, preparation is key. And for that, we decided this following plan. So quite an involved um, um, procedure. We plan to do an ultrathin DSEC, intraocular lens exchange, summary removal, Yamani, anti-retracting, and surgical iridotomy. So ultrathin DSEC. Um, Dr. Eichmann, with regards to the target, what, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, how does one target for an ultrathin DSEC? Great, thank you. Yeah, so there's a, there's a few things you know you got to take into account when you're planning the IOL target here, right? So yep. the first is that we're going to be exchanging a lens, and so the CT Lucia, when you get it out of the box, so to speak, and you have an A constant, that A constant is for putting it in the back. So the first thing you need to do is take that A constant and modify it based on your own Yamane results, and everyone will make their needle passes slightly anterior posterior. And so you ought to look at where yours are and modify the A constant such that it, it, it represents where you put your lens. Then the next thing you need to do is decide, um, you know, what testing are you even going to use? So for these, um, you know, you, you, men you mentioned microcystic edema and no bulli, and that's important because that means you can probably use the patient's own case. Now, they're not going to be good case, but they're going to be relatively representative. Whereas if the patient had massive, micro uh, massive bulli, on the other hand, the case would be just grossly unreliable. Um, and then the question is how to measure the axial length. And, and for the, you know, every healthcare system is different. In Canada, um, an A scan uh, is covered by the government and optical biometry is not. And it can get expensive. So depending, you know, you might, you know, if they're willing to pay the extra money, it's great. But the reality is uh, an A scan is probably sufficient. And then once you've chosen your K's, your AL, your A's, your, your, you know, your A um, constant, then you pick your target. And so for me, um, you know, I actually aim about minus 1.4 for a DSEC. And the reason, you know, you'll hear quoting from minus three quarters to minus one and a half maybe. But, you know, our DSECs are usually pretty edematous, pretty sick eyes. And I think the more edematous and the sicker it is, the more I actually see hyperopic, you know, you've got a worse cornea and it can improve a lot more. So I actually aim for the, the farther side of myopia. Um, so I would aim for about minus 1.4. Great. And then with regards to suture pull through, so this is a, a technique I've learned um, from you. Um, I know back home, you know, there's variations to this, but if we just quickly go through the logic and the rationale behind that. Sure. Thanks. So, you know, <clears throat> there are a lot of ways to get a DSEC into the eye from pre non collapsing forceps, which I don't really like the idea of, to sliding it on a, on a lens glide, to I'd say what's probably the most common is using a Bucin glide and Bucin forceps. Um, but for me, I like what's called a suture pull through technique, and it will be shown in the video. But the reason I like this is I know, you know, I'm not doing DSEC in, you know, FACO DSEC. Like, DSEC is reserved for the sickest of sick eyes. And these are almost universally vitrectomized, unicameral, maybe no iris. And I'm not worried about getting the graft in. And I'm really not too worried about getting a bubble. I'm worried about where it's going to be tomorrow or even five minutes after surgery if they sit up. And for that reason, I think the suture pull through is great because it controls the graft insertion and it gives you uh, a lifeline. Like you tie it and you leave it there for a week. So if you want to rebubble, you don't have to worry about the graft dislocating. You can rebubble it to so empty your heart's content and the graft's not going anywhere. So I, that's exclusively how I introduce graphs. Brilliant, thank you. So that's exactly our plan. So let's see our video and we'll int intimately uh, pause it for comments.
Right, so we start off with a subtenon injection, a 50-50 mix of lidocaine without adrenaline 2% and pivocaine. I want the audience to look at the, um, through the pupil and look how mobile that intraocular lens is. I hope you can appreciate the pseudophytogenesis. We use our toric marker to be exactly 180 degrees and we mark two millimeters posterior to the limbus here. Now we move our attention to the DSEC. We dry off the anterior compass, pre-cut the DSEC. And just for added security and reassurance, we just mark it. It's not necessary, but it just um, adds another layer of um, safety. We then probably uh, center it and then trackline it with our eight millimeters and mark. And this is what uh, Dr. Titan was alluding to next is the suture pull through. So using a nine oh proline on a double arm needle, you just pass that needle on the distal periphery. And it is quite tricky um, because it's such a long needle, but it does allow uh, a safety aspect. And we just leave that for the time being. Now we right back. Now we use a 25 gauge so I'm just going to pause that there. So this is obviously 3.5 millimeters behind. Uh, Dr. Tagman, any other options? I mean, uh, in North America, I've seen quite a lot of um, uh, surgeons use this approach, especially anterior segment surgeons. Um, would there be any other options that we could have used? Like, yeah, that's. A, I mean, that's a great point. This is certainly a point of controversy. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna make my point while I'm doing it. I'm just gonna ask. Do you, uh, if you have your optimized video playback on for, uh, for Zoom, because it, the videos are a little bit choppy. Little so bit choppy. While, while I'm commenting, you can check that. Um, so, so yeah, so the reality is um, you've got two options. If you're, so if you're going to do a Yamane, and here we've already said we're doing Yamane, um, that's a lot of work behind the iris plane, and you cannot have vitreous there. That's, that's, if there's vitreous there, you will pull on it, and pulling on it is a risk for retinal tears and detachment. So you have to clear that vitreous. And you have to do it one of two ways. You can do it from the front, what we call a limbal anterior vitrectomy, or you can do it from the back, which is a pars plana vitrectomy. Now, in this case, the patient has already had a pars plana vitrectomy. But just for a minute, for argument's sake, let's pretend they hadn't. Um, if they hadn't, you have to decide if you're going to do one or not. And I have some general rules. The rule is they cannot be young. If you have a young patient, they have formed vitreous. Um, although we do complex anterior segment surgery, I am not a vitreoretinal surgeon um, and I'm trying to keep myself out of trouble. So if they have formed vitreous, I would not recommend a pars plana vitrectomy by an anterior segment surgeon. Um, you should see a PVD. And most of these patients, you can barely, like I'm, I'm surprised we had a cup to disc ratio. Most of these patients, you cannot see the retina and you can get a B scan to look for that PVD in case and that's yet another added area, uh, layer of security. And then there's sort of an age and that age, it's made up. It's somewhere between 50 or 60 and I prefer them to be over that age if I'm gonna do something in the pars plana. Um, the, the other time is, like we say, if they've already had a pars plana vitrectomy, then we might not be using the pars plana for vitrectomy, but like here, we're using it for infusion. And, um, and that's a huge benefit. So in these eyes, once you have a bit of a unicameral eye, once we take this lens out, put a new lens in, and um, you, you really have a full, you know, it's a unicameral eye. And an anterior chamber maintainer just doesn't work as well during the that component as a posterior infusion. With a posterior infusion, you can really increase the pressure quite well and get the DSEC to stick for that last 10 minutes. And then the last thing, which is an added bonus, is you don't have what is the largest incision in the cornea other than your main wound to suture up. And often when the lean, the wounds leak, it's often the AC, the, the AC maintainer incision, because that is a round instrument going through a linear wound, unlike all of the other wounds where we introduce linear things through them usually, or very thin things through them. So, so for me, uh, you know, yes, pars plana makes sense in those situations. And, uh, and the other thing is, of course, uh, we have every one of these patients checked by retina before and after. Um, but an anterior vitrectomy would be very, very reasonable. And sometimes, so in this case, when you have a pars plana vitrectomy, do not assume pars plana vitrectomy means perfect, totally vitre vitrectomized eye. Because in a lot of these cases, when you get in, there will actually be vitreous right by the pupil. The most anterior vitreous sometimes has not been removed well. 
And that's what's going to end up in the AC and cause problems later on. So even if they've had a uh, partial line of vitrectomy, you may want to then do an anterior vitrectomy just around the pupil to make sure it's totally clear. Um, hopefully the video is a little bit more optimized now. So we we'll continue with the 25 gauge um, trocar. Um, and now we move on to creating our peritomy. This is in preparation for the um, brown incision. So just using our west of scissors, uh, we're just creating this localized peritomy, uh, dissecting subtenons, um, and then cauterizing any bleeders. We just want a dry plane. We use a six millimeter um, mark, and then using a guarded diamond partial thickness, uh, brown shape, we go from one end to the end, and then just for a scleral corneal um, dissection using a crescent blade, as you can see, with the folding of point one twos. Um, the aim is just to create a very nice and stable um, incision <clears throat> in preparation for both our DSEC and the Yamani later on. So that's quite nicely done, six millimeters across. And then sorry, sorry to yeah. interrupt. Go ahead, please. I, I'm not sure if it's just my feed, but the video is actually choppier now. Is sorry. anyone else finding it choppier? That's just the way you operate, Josh. Oh, please. It should look smooth. Um, I've optimized the video. I mean, I okay. am in KEI, so I don't know whether okay. I could be <clears throat> the issue. Okay, no problem. Continue on, sorry. No worries. Sorry, uh, where were we? So yes. So now we've created two paracentesis. We've inserted some intracranial fanny because we want to dilate the pupil, but unfortunately it didn't really dilate much. So we want to get a bit better visualization of our IOL bag complex. So we decided to put iris hooks present, five um, as you can see here. And then we enter the eye with our keratone here. So it's Again, right through, right to the edge of the six millimeter mark that we created, trying to avoid causing from the iris um, or creating any form of plane, which we've done here. Now, using um, MST forceps, we want to ideally remove the whole bag, the lens, the S ring, all in one go, which is a very tricky feat. Um, so we're holding the anterior capsule with the MFP forceps and then trying to push the iris below uh, the whole bag complex just to, and, and even, I think this also had some progress as well to try to push the whole complex superiorly. Um, although this is an edited video, so it's actually a very tricky part of the procedure. And then, and once it's above the iris plane, with 0.12s pieces of the um, bag, and it comes out quite friable. So initially, the hatchet comes out, then you have to go in, and always protecting the bag lens complex to prevent it from um, going to the back. And eventually, after much sweat, we managed to remove the whole bag complex and the intraocular lens. <clears throat> so I, I'm going to stop there because that's this is a very important part point. So you know some people might have asked why didn't we reposition this lens? You could easily do um, you know Gore-Tex scleral suturing, and there's there's a reason that we didn't, and the reason is it, there was a big Sommerings ring, and you know I think Sommerings rings are kind of like uh, like Goldilocks. If it's too little, you're going to pierce through it and you can have the capsule shred. If it's too big, you're gonna have, you can liberate things, persistent CME, persistent inflammation, especially risk of rejection in a graft. So you're looking for that like just right Sommerings ring. So that's not very common. Most of them are too big, to be honest. And so that's why we're removing it. Um, you, cannot, you cannot eat up a Sommerings ring with an anterior vitrectomy like unit, it, it takes these tiny little bites. It doesn't want to go into the vitrector and it takes like quite literally years to eat the whole thing up. It is not, it is not the way to do it. I'm going to tell you, you do not do that. Um, and it wants to break apart. It's really friable. 
And again, if you are a vitreoretinal surgeon that plans on putting a, or, or Ike or Steve Safran or the few people that, you know, no one's going to get up in court and probably say something against, if you're a mere mortal like myself, and you have a big chunk of saw ring string land on the macula and you pick it up yourself and they have a complication, you might be liable. So my goal is to get the saw ring string out without having to call the retina people in. So even though I'm doing posterior work, so to speak, I am doing it in an anterior way. And so you really want to burp the S ring out. That is your goal, get it out in one piece. And so you wanna elevate the entire thing above the iris and if this is your first time doing it, I would say step one, bring it above the iris. Step two, put in a lens slide underneath it and deliver it over the lens slide. That's the way to get this out. And this isn't going to come out through a three millimeter incision. You need a six millimeter, you need a big incision so it doesn't break apart. So it's really important you take this thing out in one piece and it's done by turning on your posterior infusion and burping, burping this thing out with your instruments underneath it to make sure nothing falls back. And the one time you have to be even more cautious is if the patient has already had a YAG. Because as things fall into each other, into themselves, things aren't going to always go above the eye well. They can go below the eye well and follow through the posterior YAG opening, even though you've done everything right. So you really want to be careful there. This is the one of the few parts of the surgery where you can get yourself into trouble. And even though surgery goes great, they're going back to the OR with someone else to clean up something. So really important. S-ring removal is really important. Hey Josh, if I can make a couple of comments, and I, I think you, you really summed it up nicely. You know, as you know, I, I'm a big repositioner. I like to reposition complexes if I can. And one big reason is often you can do it without a vitrectomy because the, the complex is sitting on the anterior hyaloid and all the concerns you have that you raised about vitreous uh, management, you know, become less. But I do agree with you. If there's a big saw rings and you can't find that little space to pass the suture, usually I look at the haptic optic junction, you know, and if I can place the suture around the haptic optic junction, you can kind of get away with it. But it is technically challenging. If you tie the suture too tight, then you can rip through the bag and can liberate saw rings. I think if saw rings stay sequestered in the bag, then you're okay. But if it gets liberated, then that's a problem. And that's, I think, what you judged here uh, to be the issue. So I, I, think, I think that makes a lot of sense. What type of lens was this? Was this a foldable lens or was it a rigid lens? It was, it was I don't remember the exact lens, but it was foldable. Okay. Because yeah. I mean, you know, I, and I think you, you always do the right thing as far as getting that, the complex as a whole, but sometimes what I'll do is I'll just cut the lens in the anterior chamber and remove it through a smaller incision to avoid the larger incision. But at the risk of that is, of course, you lose some saw rings posteriorly. You have to balance that out. And this, this elastics are important for that part, but... That's totally agree. Ask. So totally agree. If I'm going to cut, if, I mean, we took out a lens yesterday, in fact, and I'm always cutting and going through a small incision. But if, if it's got a big saw rings ring, I think that it's easier to, to make a large incision, burp it out, and then not have to worry about it being, you know, anything, any S ring going to the back. And then the other thing, though, is, you know, I'm, I'm pretty particular about my incisions. And as you saw here, it is a scleral, it's a frown shaped scleral tunnel three step incision, right? Which is basically self sealing. Like we put sutures in because obviously we're going to do a desec, but, but these are really, they're very good wounds. Mm -hmm. Those are great pearls. Thank you both. So we move on. Um, we now performed uh, an anti vitrectomy just to make sure that there's no incarceration that may happen during the lens. And then outside the eye, we're now just docking the haptics onto our 30 gauge TSK needles. These are thin walled needles. So we do that for both uh, the needles, both the superior one and the inferior one that we will use. So that's like a really important step. We now deliver the uh, intraocular lens into the eye. The leading haptic remains on top of the iris and the trailing one just sits outside the wound uh, externally. As uh, Dr. Heigman just mentioned, we then just temporarily close the wound just for anterior chamber um, stability, um, which you can see here, before uh, we decide to go in again, like in a beveled fashion, 1.5 millimeters behind the initial mark that we made. Um, and we can see the bevel in the anterior chamber now. Now we use the MST forceps to dock the haptic into the bevel. 
how's this going here? So we do that and then we gently follow the same path that we created um, to come out of the eye. So we do the same procedure, but in the opposite direction um, for the inferior um, um, double 30 gauge needle. And actually the, the trailing haptic is a little bit more tricky um, for either of you, Dr. Dr. Ahmed, any tips or tricks when trying to load these um, lenses? It's, it's obviously easy um, when you see on a video, but they're very tricky when you're actually inside the eye. Any tips or tricks? So what, one thing I will say that it helps, you know, you know how you're leading haptic, which is currently in the 30 gauge needle? You see how your yeah. needle is still is pulled out of the eye quite a bit? You see that it should, on the left side? Actually, it's, it, no, if you look at where the, it's not that bad. Look at where the bend is, but fair enough, fair enough. No, no, but I, I push the needle all the way in to the hub. Mm. And do, by doing that, the lens rotates so the haptic is more aligned with your second needle. So that's so, one little tip, and I learned the hard, hard way. If you push that 30 gauge needle all the way in, the first pass you made, now the lens isn't as rotated this way, it's rotated this way, and the haptic can be more aligned with the with the second needle. I hope that exactly. makes sense. And there's there's really two there's really two um, schools of thought here, you know, because like so for instance, I always like to leave it in there. I actually don't retract it. I, I just leave it where it is. And then I just let the needle sort of crawl gently so it doesn't hit anything in the eye and then do my second pass. But you know, there's, there's a group of people and even more, which is, this is not what Shin Yamani described initially, who actually remove it, um, cauterize the first haptic and then do the second. And so that really ties one of your arms down and gives you a very awkward angle for the second one. So if that's the way you do it every day, you're used to it, but it definitely gives a weird angle um, and so I like to redock if I don't have really good centration. And when you redock, you you already have both out. You pick the worst one and you're going to redock that one. So you do melt the first one. And I find when I redock, it is, wait, it's awkward. It is. So what your point is right. You should leave that first needle in the eye and, uh, and, and maybe even more so. And then the other thing that I would add is even with that needle in the eye, um, when you are starting the process, there, you know, this is, there's a tip that Steve Saffron taught me that I kind of lived by for a bit and then changed. So I used to try to, um, what he suggested is you take the needle and you use it to push on the optic. And as you're pushing on the optic, that trailing haptic, which is initially out of the eye, is starting to come in. And you sit with your MST's jaws open right at the inside of the main wound, the internal ostium of the main wound. And where you, when you've got the amount of haptic you want, that's when you grab it, you bring it in, and in one swoop, you sort of dock it. And I used to do that, and I actually found that the even though you got the right length, the angle of the way the haptic and it was uh, like the MST was grabbing the uh, the haptic was very awkward. And so what I've often done now is actually brought the haptic in, put it into the angle, and then re-grabbed it from the angle. And I find, although some initially it can be challenging to grab something from the angle, I find now it's actually the easier way, and you get a bit of so it's the the it's not just the length of haptic you have, but the angulation that you have. Um, and but yeah, but but yeah, those are those are my my tips, and I think Ike has a really good point about the length of the the uh, haptic in the eye. And just a subtle point, which you did here, your main incision is temporal, and you kind of placed your haptic surgeon's view at about like what eight and eight and two o'clock, right? Yes, so rather than three and nine. Yes, so the exactly. Position makes it easier because your needle is now farther away from your main incision where your haptic is, so you can kind of line up a bit easier. Yeah, um, that's a really good point. That does help as well. So the positioning is important. And then the only other thing is just, you know, use the back wall of that bevel of that 30 gauge to line the haptic and just, even if the haptic's not lined up parallel to it, it'll follow the back wall of the bevel if you just, you know, touch the back wall and then let it slide along the needle itself. That's a little yes. tip. I mean, the video will show that easier, but that's a little tip uh, to do that. And, um, you know, I think that those are some of the pros I think to help with that trailing haptic, which is, I agree, the harder one to put in. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, like I use it like a backboard, right? Once it's on it and you start pushing, it'll follow. So that's a good point. I didn't, I don't, yeah, I don't think we said that out loud, but good, good point. Thank you so much. Those are really good tips. 
So I don't know if you, guys, I don't know if you have the haptics right now. They're both equidistant out of the eye right now. So now you can look for centration because this is the, the lens should be perfectly centered right now when the haptics are out of that sclera at the same distance, the same length. If it's not, don't bury them. Once you bury them, it's harder to adjust. Exactly. I actually do what I call a haptic test. So once I take the haptics out, I grab the, the end of the haptics with the two MSTs and I bring them right up to where they will be. And if it's not centered, I then see if I nudge one, will it work? If I nudge one, the other, will it work? What if I nudge both? And I test, I play around for centration. And almost, you know, most of the time you can get a pretty well centered lens as you'll see in this. But sometimes, you know, one pass is too long. And you know, what's really, what's really common is you think, you know, your external osteum is this nice and centered, but you think your in your external osteum is normal, but you have a longer pass on one side than the other. So your internal osteum or where the needle enters is different. And that's what's causing the issue. And, um, and that the tip for avoiding that is just like when you're making a phaco incision, if you have a really soft eye, you make a super long tunnel. And if you have a hard eye, often your tunnel is really short and you have a shorter wound than you expect. The same is true here. And that's why you need the infusion and you need the infusion on when you're making the passes. So you have the same IOP for both passes. Can I ask, would you consider a different type of lens, a fake lenses? Great point. Yeah. So, so this is this is the you know the Zeiss CT Lucia 602, previously the Aaron uh, EC3 PAL. <clears throat> this is by far my favorite lens for it, and it's because of the haptics. And as you know, this is the lens that most uh, North American and European surgeons will use. Uh, this is uh, FDA approved. It is not Health Canada, but we have to obtain what we call special access to use this lens. Um, so it just it's one extra step. Uh, they are going for Health Canada approval. Actually, apparently they're very close. I've heard, but um, but there are other lenses um, like the um, the same ten is the lens that Imana used. The reason you want to use this isn't the optic; it's the it's the PVDF haptics, which are I'm going to say nearly indestructible. They are not indestructible, and they can be bent and they can be broken, and they can be pulled out right from the optic. Um, so you still have to be somewhat gentle. But the haptics are must much more robust. And other lenses. I've used the ME60 AC, which I would really not recommend. And I've used the, uh, I've used the LI61, which I wouldn't recommend. And then I've used the AR40 and the, uh, what is it, ZA9003. Those two lenses, I, I just say AR40 is probably um, the best lens that's Health Canada approved to use, even though it has the PMMA haptics, which are as friable as ME60 or something like that. They, um, the ME60 has more of a curve to the end of the haptic, and the AR40 has less of a curve, so it's better for docking. And I'm pretty sure, I don't want to speak for it, but I, I'm pretty sure you've, you've used a lot more AR40s than I have. I feel like you don't always work. Yeah. So what's your experience? <clears throat> hey, Josh, your audio is a little bit uh, choppy. I apologize for University of Toronto cornea service with the video and audio problems. I don't know what they're doing, but... The glaucoma people have to teach them a, bit, a couple of things here. So yeah, I mean, AR40 works well. CT Lucia is great. Um, but AR40, you got to be a bit careful when you, you know, those haptics can kink. Um, so yeah, I, I think the point about other lenses, I know that some surgeons use the Acrios lens, which is, uh, can be used with Gore-Tex suture. Um, it's a hydrophilic lens. So some of us don't like it that way. And the Carla Valley lens also, uh, is used not so much in North America, but I know many people use it. I don't know if, I think in the UK, you folks use it as well. Um, I don't have a lot of experience. I don't have experience with that. I know it's a hydrophilic, although are you using the hydrophobic lens now version? I don't know, but I hear, I hear good things about that lens. Yeah. Good what, point about non Yamane lenses as well. Yeah. I, I don't like the Acrios because of the hydrophilic for sure. Yeah. And I mean, you can do a CZ 70 too, technically if you want. And we did do it. We did have to make a big incision here. Um, anyways, but, uh, so lot, lots of options. I just think, you know, it's such a nice, uh, such an elegant technique. Samer, what, what, do you, what do you use? You were going to say something. You yeah, I was saying I use the Italian lens, <laughs> the Calivelli. I think, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I wish they could do uh, something hydrophobic, be nicer. But um, it's, it's very well centered. It's quite a huge, large lens. Um, to be honest, very easy to implant. Um, the, uh, personally, I feel there's a lot less faff with it compared with the... Um, the Yamani technique, uh, just, but again, it's, it depends on how frequently you use it and then you be familiar with it. 
Yeah, I, I, I hear, I hear, I hear it's very, they have very good results. I mean, for an Italian lens, I mean, it's not bad. It comes with the style life. <laughs> Great. So we rejoined the video. So we've inserted the first part. So the intraocular lens um, and the Marnie technique has been performed. Now we move our attention to uh, the DSEC. So we use a PRK marker, eight millimeters, um, and we just ink the epithelial surface just to help guide where our decimeter rectus is. We already have our two paracentesis uh, made. And in the usual um, fashion, we just score at least twice around. Um, once we eventually get into the anterior chamber, yes. So, uh, so we're just scoring twice around. Um, and actually, this the decimeter X was a little bit um, difficult to, to peel off, um, but we eventually did manage to uh, remove it. Um, and then we proceed to applying some Michael to try and shrink the pupil, um, as well as forming an anterior um, retracting, which you can see now, because again, in order to ensure appropriate adhesion uh, of the desect tissue. We want it to be completely clear in the anterior chamber. And see, maybe there might be a little bit of peaking of the pupil over here, which is why we're focusing our retractor in that direction. And then we also formed a surgical um, PI, which we haven't shown in this particular video. We just try and bring the pupil down a little bit more. Um, just to again help with the air management. We now revert to our attention to the donor tissue itself. We apply that into the Boosin glide, as you can see. It's still dangling with those two nanoproline sutures. We need to be really mindful of where and the orientation of those needles are. So there's one which is emanating from the endothelial side and one emanating from the extremis side, and that becomes relevant in terms of the positioning and where we plan to exit the wound from the host cornea. We gently thread it in through the Boussin ostium before um, pulling it up to the edge. Now you can see right at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the needle being in you know, zig zigzag fashion, trying to avoid any catheter of any iris tissue or corneal tissue. And this particular tissue is going to the limbus, and that equates to the endothelial side of where that donor tissue was. So this is all part of the suture pull through desect tissue. And now the next needle pass, it will emanate from the stroma side, and that will be about a millimeter away from the limbus, which we'll see um, now. So it's best to hold the needle at the end where the suture is, just to give you a little bit more um, space. And then finally, enters uh, enter a chamber and exits about a millimeter so behind. And then with those two sutures now secure, we can now deliver the donor tissue. We just bring the boosting glide towards the main wound and just lift it up a little bit and the donor tissue just enters the eye. An important thing to note, is like whenever nice you're as well. so, yeah. sorry so something really important to note is whenever you're entering an eye with a suture needle right so whether it be for the suture pull through technique or if you're going to do say a seeps or not in an iris you should always be sweeping back and forth because i've seen people tie iris to the cornea or you know tie their graft to the cornea because they've caught fibers on the way into the eye. So it's really important to sweep back and forth. And it's always really important, even with these two needle passes, to make sure you don't twist them. And uh, that really becomes more of something, you know, you just want to be cognizant of, especially if you're doing sutured IOLs or iris repair work, because you don't want to do a lot of work and find out that you've got a twist or something like that. It's really spaghetti management, so. Perfect. Um, and then we, Apply an air bubble just to secure the that it's nicely centered, and then we form an air knot. So this is not a 
traditional tight knots just to secure the donor tissue in place so that if we do need to rebuild the clinic, for example, we can use that. So it's quite a loose knot. You can see, let's say, uh, one, one, one knot. We close the placentesis and all our main wounds just to ensure appropriate air management and conclude so the money is well fixated and orientated and the patient is currently on cred four, four times a day and tim log twice a day and the patient is subjectively happy and has noticed an improved vision I'm going to hand over to Dr. Teichman to go through some pearls and summarize some of the things that we already discussed. Great. Thank you. I hope I'm not choppy. I noticed a lot of it is coming in and out choppy. So okay. hopefully you can yeah, hear me okay. today. It's sounding better. Yeah. Okay, great. So, so why DSEC? I mean, the reality is I have done demechanized like this. I'm not, I'm not concerned that I won't be able to perform the surgery, but I don't think there's a reason to, and I think there are reasons against it. Um, the reality is this patient, their vision is limited by their retina, and we're not talking like a line or two. They've got significantly limited vision, and I don't think the potentially one line better vision of a DMAC is really all that important here. I'm not worried about getting a good air bubble at the end of surgery. What I'm worried about is showing up the next day and the air being completely in the vitreous, which it almost always is half gone into the vitreous. These are poor dilating, poor constricting eyes that require iris hooks in a unicameral vitrectomized eye. The air wants to go back as soon as they sit up. And so for that reason, I want to use something that is less important to have an air bubble in for a, for a duration of time. And gas is not the answer here either, because you still have gas that's going to go to the back. And these are actually eyes where if gas goes to the back, you can actually get a really bad uh, posterior pressure. And so, and, and it's difficult to treat. Uh, you need to basically, puncture into the vitreous to, to release it. So DSEC is probably, uh, not probably, is absolutely uh, better in these cases for adherence. And um, the other thing is there have been studies that compare DSEC to DMEC in vitrectomized eyes that show DMECs do worse. They have more complications. So the literature actually supports DSEC here. Um, the, uh, so that's why DSEC. Why Yamane? Um, for, to, for me, if uh, I'm not going to leave a huge Somerings ring there, like we talked about before, and so that, that's got to go. So now that we're doing an eye well exchange, I want to do Yamani because I think that it is probably the most elegant way to put a lens into the eye right now. Um, we actually talked about the eye well calculations earlier, so I think that's been covered. And we did get to touch on the type of vitrectomy and the factors. So really, you know, I don't want it to be a young person with foreign vitreous. They have to have a PVD. They have to be older. Um, if they've already been vitrectomized, great. Uh, occasionally, we will do anterior vitrectomy if they don't meet those, uh, those, those few uh, criteria. But often, we will do posterior vitrectomy. Um, but, you know, we're not cavalier. And we have all the patients checked before and after by our retina service so that if a tear is, is found, it can be lasered. Um, and that's what I mean by additional consults. These patients see retina. If they're coming to me with an anterior chamber IOL and a decompensated cornea, by definition, they had a complex cataract surgery. They're already at risk for tears and detachments. And what I'm gonna do is going to increase them because we're gonna do a big surgery. So I wanna cover myself and protect the patient too. Um, and I think there's one more page of uh, pearls. Yes, uh, intraoperative pearls. Yes, so intraoperatively, just waiting for it to come up on mine. Um, you know, the anytime you put a needle through a sclera, it is very painful. Now, I can tell you this with good history because I did my first few of these under topical, as in tetracaine drops and then sometimes lidocaine intracamerally. And patients were very uncomfortable. I'm actually surprised. Oh, I'm very surprised by how uncomfortable patients were. Uh, is my is my sound still coming out okay? Yes, a little bit muffled, but I think it keeps. I, okay, um, there you go. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. So, so um, I did a few of these under call. I, I didn't realize how mean a person I was, and I feel terrible for these patients that I did. This with. Um, so I always give a good block, and I like a sub T non block. I I I I don't like the idea of. Uh, 
I don't like retrovulvars. I think a sub tenons gives 99% the anesthesia and some akinesia as well. And it's in my, in my hands very safe. Um, I always mark carefully, you know, they say measure twi twice cut once. So you'll see the marking before every case. I'm not going to eyeball this. I'm going to mark exactly where I want to place my haptics. I test the haptics because the last thing you want to do is find out in the eye that something doesn't fit, right? So always test. And I test both needles and both haptics. And, and part of the reason is if for some reason they hand me the wrong needle or this or that, I don't have to worry about any of it. I know everything fits no matter what. I redock and... Um, uh, I think that's really important. You can't, once you've done all of this and you feel like you're great and you look and it's super decentered, you can't just say, well, I did a great surgery. Like you can't leave the patient like that. You need to have a centered lens. And so redocking uh, requires picking which haptic is poorer um, and then taking the better haptic, melting the, making a flange and then redocking, the, bringing the, the poorer placed haptic back into the eye and then redocking it into the needle. And that uh, is, uh, you know, as Ike was saying, it's, uh, you know, it, it's easier when you've got the needle in the eye. It is easier because you're, you're not so tied. So um, it's a little bit more challenging, but there's a trick to it. And you kind of get the angles a little bit. Always do a surgical PI. There are some people, and this surgical PI, I mean, we all talk about PIs for DMAC and, and, and or DSEC. Um, and if people do them or not, this PI is not for that. This PI is for the Yamane. Um, there are some people like Steve Saffron who advocates two PIs on every single Yamane because of people walk. I won't go as far as saying that, but I do a general, I use the, the retractor and I do the Alcon machine has the, the, the VIT PI setting and I use that and it makes a big hole. So that's what I do. And we talked about the pull through method, why to use it. and then the air management. Air management is, is an issue in these uh, unicameral eyes. Tips. So I think um, for time we'll move on to our second case. So this is a 35 year old gentleman. He's an ex-football player, not a soccer player um, like your David Beckham, so Cristiano Ronaldo, but an American football player. And you referred for a left acute hydrox and bilaterally had quite an advanced trachoconus. Um, two years ago, he had cross-linking in the USA in both eyes. He had floppy eyelids. He was an eye rubber and he was a large, large gentleman, large BMI and probably had obstructive sleep apnea. When he presented to us, he was unable to tolerate glasses, contact lenses or sclerals. So on examination, the patient had really characteristic craticonic signs um, and right eye equal scarring, coning. The cornea was incredibly thin, uh, of about 20%. In the left eye, the patient had acute um, high drop. You can see the tear quite visibly. Apart from the anterior segment findings, the retina um, and the lens was um, unremarkable. So the plan was um, dull. So let's play this video and then we'll like the last intermittently stop. So one thing I've learned here in, the UK, in Canada is we do many of the doubts and PKPs under you know, subtenons or local anesthetic or sedation, which I know back home we would do under PKP. But the patient here may not appreciate, but was moving quite a lot. Um, we marked the center of the pupil, to put out eight point markers here, and then it was quite a large cornea, relatively, we decided on an 8.5 millimeter um, trepanation. So we've got a good suction here uh, and then proceed to slowly um, finding it. So three dials to get the blade flush. And then we move, I think, like five, five turns um, before we stopped. Um, and that gave us, and hopefully enough uh, depth. We then check that there has actually been a, a trepanation, there has been a cut, which you can see here. And now this is the more tricky part. So we now use our sector, um, slowly entering the eye, we're trying to go as deep as possible. Remember the point is incredibly thin, the patient's actually moving quite a lot. Um, so it's actually going in quite smoothly. And there, was, there wasn't much resistance, which is often a, a good sign. So 
going in slowly but surely. I want to create a, a track. And then we fully come out and then go in again, but this time with an airfield cannula. And we go past our initial um, tunnel that we created to press the cannula down a little bit uh, before we inject. You see initially it's like a bit of a superficial uh, full eye bubble and you can see uh, air entering the piece of the definitely some form of perforation. So I'm just going to stop here for the panel members here. What would you do at this situation? Would you convert to PKP, continue with DALC? What are your thoughts and what are your rationales in here? Anyone? I know what I did. So uh, maybe someone, uh, let's uh, pick on someone. I don't, I don't know, is it fair to pick on Artemis? Is that allowed or, or what's, what are the rules here? Yeah, you're allowed, of course. So, well, micro perforation, I think you could um, carry on. Mm -hmm. So it depends, but you, what you had there. Great. I think, I think you carried on. <laughs> yeah, so I, I totally agree. I think, I think, you know, you've got nothing to lose other than time. Right. So, you know, some of these docs you book and they take, you know, three times as long as a PK would take, right? Like they take quite some time, but I, I totally agree. You have nothing to lose by carrying on and seeing what you can do. Right. So, uh, so that's what we did here. And, uh, why don't we, uh, we'll play the video and we'll, we'll see how, uh, how it goes. So here we're just, you know, we're gently removing the anterior cap, just using the crescent blade. Um, you know, as Dr. Tyken said, it was a laborious effort, but worth it in the end. Um, this is sped up a little bit, but gently just remove the anterior cap. Just be mindful to avoid that potential area of perforation. You can really visibly see it, but we thought roughly where it could be, you know, um, just off the visual axis. Um, just gently stripping off the tissue and just finding different planes that we can use and just hang on, just porting the tissue up. Um, but to take to that. And I just want to make a comment. Look at the, the movement uh, of the eyeball. This is how tricky this particular case was. Um, so just gently just finding a plane and then using it uh, as a area where we can just almost like rec sick uh, it out um, and try and get to the decimate. One of the tricky parts I think is, is actually trying to find these planes. Dr. Tyson, any tips in identifying these planes or trying to uh, use that to cleave even further down towards the decimate? How does one um, do that? Yeah, so, so there's definitely some tips. So there's a few. So the first is, you know, what we want to have, we want to end up with less than 50 microns of residual tissue. That's, that's the goal. If, if you can get close to bearing decimate, it's great, but that is not necessary. And in a layer by layer dissection, sometimes that's not ideal, especially if you have a perforation, because with no other support but decimates, that can actually just splay open limbus to limbus, or, or rather for eight millimeters. So um, what you want to do is you want to find a tissue plane. So here is a great example of that where I'm holding and I'm going with a blunt dissector first and trying to find a tissue plane. And this, this is all very thin stuff, right? Like this is very thin stuff to deal with. Um, couple tips. One, these are, these are Calibri forceps, but if you can get 0.1 forceps, not 0.12s, but 0.1, and I think Duckworth and Kent makes them, that's a really fine forcep to use. And they're very nice. Um, we don't have them, but those are really nice. Two is you want to use some sort of uh, blunt dissector. And um, sometimes it's nice to just put some BSS on the cornea and leave it for a minute and just hydrate what stroma is left. And then everything just is, is, is bigger. And you have a little bit more to grab and a little bit more to work with and a little bit easier to get underneath. So on a case like that, that's usually what I'll do is and I'll find it. I'll find an area that seems the deepest. I'll make a little uh, pocket. I'll extend that pocket, and then I'll go with the crescent blade and, and, and remove that sort of 
layer, so to speak, and then try to find the next one and the next one. And um, what you do is you do this all the way around and you really want to address the place where you think your perforation is last. And this is where the video seems to pause. So this is what I'm going to say. So really, if you look, this actually was really unroofing the previous perforation. If you, if you go back, I just, just so you, you know, don't think that we perforated twice here. If you look, I cut, I move back and it's actually deflating when I'm not near it. Right. It's, it's, it's unroofing the final perf. And so you really want to do that area last. And, um, and that way you can sort of, uh, you've got, you've done as much as you can. And you see here, it's off axis, it's not central, obviously, um, which, which is, means the patient can have an excellent visual result and keep their own endothelium, right? Which is our, which is our goal in a, in a guy that's probably 30, I forget what we said here, 32. So, you know, it, it, a lifelong of his own endothelium is nice. So. Exactly. So you can see majority of like 95, almost 99% of the death may appears is still intact. So we proceeded to dial. Um, we just removed, stripped off the endothelium from the donor tissue to the aid of vision blue, um, trephinated of the same size, so 8.5 millimeters as the host. Um, and with that in mind, we transferred the donor tissue um, onto the host and suturing um, with tenno nylon. Second suture, as we know, is the most important for astigmatism management. You can see here it's had a nice bisection of the cornea. Uh, donor tissue. Uh, two sutures become four sutures and you can see this quite nicely symmetrical. Uh, as we, and then finally after a few minutes we have 16 sutures. So for that subject are capable to help with the closure of the uh, desme or try and reduce some of that. So we applied an air bubble just like one would do in a DMEC or a DSEC. Um, and that would hopefully in subsequent few weeks will scar and resolve. So two weeks post -op, so I saw this patient this week actually and visual QT is 2050. Remember he was counting fingers before. And that's only two weeks post op. He's doing phenomenally well. All the sutures are looking great. He does have that small redundant bulb visual axis. But um, hopefully that will then scar off and not be an issue. He's on prep four, four times a day uh, and just big more for uh, a week. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Teichman again. I think he's touched on some of those points, but um, just to emphasize them a little bit more. Great. Thank you, Nazar. Very well presented. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think actually there's a few things that I want to comment on that I just, I didn't want to interrupt the video again. Uh, I want to let us get through it on time, but, um, you know, one of the things is people talk about not needing to take the endothelium off on a dock. And some people say you can just put the endothelium, like leave the graft the way it is. I'm a, I would really, really recommend always removing the endothelium. I've been burned once. We had a, I had a very, very, um, high BMI patient who uh, had a small per who actually had a small perforation and I would just wanted to get the new graft on as quick as possible and she had a persistent double decim uh, double AC she refused uh, AC like a rebubble and she refused it mul on multiple occasions and eventually her own decimate scarred and contracted so much that she developed 20 diopters of astigmatism. So we ended up, uh, and we had to keep her on steroids longer because she had a PK and we knew that her endothelium was never gonna work again. And we ended up, she ended up developing cataract. So I had to go in, remove the decimase membrane, do the cataract. It released 20 diopters of astigmatism. Um, it, she did quite well in the end, but it was a whole uh, scenario that could have been avoided by, no, by not listening to people that said, you can leave it on. So maybe people have had great experience with that, but I've had terrible experience with that. So I would definitely always um, remove the endothelium of the donor cornea during a dolph. Um, but often I can see why people don't want to. These are usually, you know, you're looking at the eye being held together by five microns of tissue and you're like, ah, let's just finish this up. Um, <clears throat> so 
Um, the, the next thing I'm going to say is, uh, you know, these, we, we, I, I almost jokingly say that most of these patients have a BM, like have a weight and, you know, we we, uh, we use pounds often. Uh, I know that I, I, I was surprised to learn that the UK uses pounds too. I don't know. I guess we should both be using metric, but neither of us do. Um, so I have many patients where their weight in pounds to central corneal thickness is two right? Like they, they are very, very big and their corneas are very, very thin. And these are not good eyes to get a big bubble. And if you do, you know, you are scared when you're looking at this eye. So, you know, we know that these are more likely to have trouble getting a big bubble because there's just not enough resistance outward for the air to go inward. And so for that reason, we, you have to go in thinking that you may be doing a layer by layer dissection and just book accordingly. So you're not rushing. Um, you know, many perforations can be salvaged. I, you know, I am, I'm fortunate that I've, I've been able to salvage a lot of these, but I've seen, you know, people um, far, far better than me salvage far, far crazier perforations. So we've always got a, a way to go. Um, so I think though that these are, they can be salvaged. And to be honest, layer by layer dissection is probably one of the most fun things we can do in the OR. I actually think it's one of my favorite things. So, um, you know, if you book yourself time and you're not rushing because you think you're, they're going to cancel your last case on you, you have a lot of time to do this and, and, and really, um, hone your, your microsurgical skills, because I think this is one of the more intricate things we do. Um, and leave that perforation safe for last, like we said. And lastly, you, if you have a small perforation off of the visual axis, it's okay to leave a bit of stroma there if you have to, and just not, not open it up. In fact, I would recommend leaving enough tissue that it doesn't open up. It's actually the goal to do that, but sometimes you know, you're on the right plane and it just comes right off. And often you don't know where the perforation site is exactly because you've got an edematous, sorry, emphysitous cornea from the failed big bubble. Um, so, um, you know, occasionally you'll need to rebubble. So I always leave an air bubble in the eye if you have a if you've got a perforation, and occasionally you'll need to rebubble them, and uh, and you just you just want this to stick, of course, and uh, and as uh, Nazar mentioned. You might have redundant decimase. Not I don't just mean I don't mean a perforation. I don't mean double AC. I mean you took a cornea that was huge and really you know prolapsing and you've made it normal size. There's way more decimates than there is new cornea. And it's not uncommon that even in a perfect uh, DMAC, uh, sorry, doll, you have redundant cornea and you might need to do a bubble to get it to stick where you want. And there have been reports of people actually taking crescents out of the decimates to make it oppose better and all these things that I wouldn't do unless you're, I don't even know why, but, but generally just, just think of the anatomy and that there might be mismatch between the amount of decimase membrane and the size of your transplanted cornea. And then, uh, and, and, you know, leaving a patient with adult, as long as they don't have a big scar centrally and they can't see is the best outcome for the patient because they can go a long time with their own endothelium. So I think, I think those are the, the pearls here. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. And um, can I actually ask a question um, in terms of achieving this big bubble? What about corneas with previous cross linking, previous intracornea ring segments and scarring? How, how easy do you find to? Great, great question. So I find that a cross linking, I have not, I have not found cross linking um, causes much difference in getting a big bubble. Um, now this patient was cross linked, and it was. It didn't happen, but uh, generally, I don't find it. It makes much of a difference. Um, I have found that intacts. I've done. I've done DALT in intacts, and I haven't found that intacts has made much of a difference. But you want to, you know, it's always about sort of aim, like you know, aiming your your cannula, your blunt, or your you know, your relatively blunt dissector, and then using. So the other thing is the cannula we use. We don't use a bent 30 gauge needle. I use a tan DALT cannula and there are lots of different um, cannulas by different companies developed by different people. But the whole pur purpose of it is it has its port on the bottom so that you, when you press down with a little bit of force, your, act, your air is going down. Um, so I find that that really helps. But um, back to, to what you're doing and what I'm doing, talking about the, um, if you've got corneal rings, I haven't, I would usually, I just usually pull them out most of the time. Um, and I find that it hasn't really made much of a difference. Um, and then of course, if you have someone that's had previous high drops, um, then, and this patient had high drops in the other eye, of course, if you have someone with previous high drops, you don't do a big bubble, of course, 
Um, you can do a dock if the high drops doesn't involve the center. If the high drops involves the center, you're going to have to leave tissue centrally and you can get all kinds of funny astigmatism. And I just think at that point, like our goal is to make these people see better. So if they're willing to see better in that scenario, then they're willing to have a PK. So, but, but I think if you have a high drops and sometimes you have these really, you know, like, you know, when you see people years later and you can see this beautiful outline where the high drops was like it's so well scarred and if it's small and if it's it's in the periphery um i think a layer just plan for layer to, by layer dissection on those people right off the bat and they, they can do really well too josh that's great can i add one thing I, and Please. i observed difficulty doing a big bubble in those who had cross-linking where to be honest is uh, you know crosslink you to crosslink the top 300 microns i think sometimes the target is missed and the deeper cornea is crosslinked as well and I think those where you can find difficulty doing the uh, big bubble, and I've seen that in at least a couple of cases where actually you can see that there's a deep haze and scar in the cornea, and those are, it was impossible to do big bubble. So that's my, but I think that's a technique of cross was not perfect. For sure. Thank you for that. That's good to think about. It's definitely good to think about. Thank you. Thank you uh, for, for that. And I think that concludes our session. I think we're a little bit overrun and a bit of a plug for University of Toronto during the pandemic. We created a, a website with similar videos and tips and tricks on corneasurgery.ca. So unless there's any further questions, um, thank you again for the invitation. Um, hey, thank you very much. Questions? Thank you, Professor Takeman. Um, amazing. Both videos amazing and all the description and the tips that you gave us, they were brilliant. I think there is a question from the audience, if, if you have some time. I know that you're in the middle of your day, actually, but... Uh, we're, we got time. We, we finished. We finished early. <laughs> okay. We've got time. We've got time. Ask away. We're here for you guys. Great. Thank you very much. So there is a question from the audience. Um, the question is, thank you for the interesting talk. If I may ask regarding lens types, do you think posterior, posterior iris fixed very sized lens would also be an option? That's for the first video, the first case that you showed. Or should scholarly fixated lenses be preferred? And regarding sure. Yamani, is there some good way to prevent postoperative lens tilt? Per okay, uh, perfect. I'll answer the first and the second. <laughs> so, so for the um, so for the lens for a fakia, that, like that's the um, the artisan lens, right? The artisan um, iris claw lens. There is a description of retropupillary enclavation. So basically, you take the lens, you actually have to flip it upside down because it's vaulted, so you can't just do it the normal way you would. So you flip it upside down, you dive it behind the iris, and then you, instead of, you know, normally you pull up iris, here you push down iris between the claws. Um, one, I, I've actually done about 10 of these in my fellowship. Um, you know, when you're the fellow, you just do whatever they tell you to do. So that's what I did. Um, I will tell you for anyone actually doing it, you should get special forceps called secundo forceps. And the, these forceps are meant to hold the IOL um, under the pupil, so that, through the pupil, so you can do this uh, securely and you're not holding it with something flimsy. Um, my, my big concern with it, so you, there's a lot of manipulation behind the iris. And, um, and I've seen, luckily not my own case, but I've seen, you know, giant retinal tears from it. But that being said, you can have that from a Yamani. So in either of these, you need a, a thorough anterior vitrectomy. Um, I don't like anything tugging on the iris, even if it's behind the iris. Like I, I've done, you know, many iris sutured IOLs, but really it's, it's pretty particular situations. I just think that iris chafe constantly leads to CME, chronic inflammation, and possibly graft rejection. So yes, that technique exists, and some people have definitely had good results with it. Um, it's not going to be my go-to technique. And the reality is I actually don't find it's that much easier, uh, yeah, easier than a Yamani. Um, with regards to the Yamani question, what, how to avoid lens tilt. So that is purely related to, um, to, like I said, measure twice, cut once. So think about your haptic insertions, not just two millimeters back. You got to think of it in three dimensions, X, Y, Z. So two millimeters, so it's exactly 180 degrees apart two millimeters posterior to that, and your intrascleral passes have to be identical such that your internal ostiums are exactly 180 degrees away as well. So you have them the same 
on the same plane in the same distance in the same angle and not going one way or another, either like towards or away from the limbus, which is going to also cause a change. Any of those things are gonna cause decentration and, and or tilt to some degree. So the key is really marking and measuring. It's more that than anything. Then once you've marked and measured, your needle passes. Um, like I was saying, you need a firm eye. So you need infusion, whether it's posterior or anterior chamber, you need the eye pumped up and firm so that you can titrate how long your needle passes. And it's gotta be the same on both. It's gotta be the same firmness when you make your needle passes on both so that the, so that the scleral passes end up identical. And that's how you avoid it. And if you do have tilt or decentration, you don't leave them like that. You choose which haptic is better. You externalize it a bit. You melt, you cauterize like you normally would. You then go in to the eye with your MSTs and grab the haptic from inside, bring it all the way in, redock, and then, uh, sorry, re redo your needle pass and then dock it again. And um, that is, uh, and so that you've got a second chance. And you can, you can do this a few times. Like the goal is not to leave them with a uh, tilt because there's nothing worse than, you know, making, you know, having a great surgery. You know, I think, you know, when we learn surgery, we just want to say that we did it. That, oh, this is first Yamane, first whatever. And, and it kind of, in your mind, it ends like when you leave the OR that day and you get coffee and talk about the cases. Once you're in practice, you realize it doesn't end that day. It ends, you know, at the one month visit or whenever when they leave happy, right? Like if day one, you look at them and they have eight diopters of internal astigmatism, like, that's not good and you know they're not going to see well despite a clear you know it's like the retina guys no no you know not no disrespect to them they're like retinas attached they're lp vision and they're like a oh, success like high-fiving and you know that's not that's not a win right so you you need to have so you know you, so i think that that type of thing and, and it's you know your first case you're going to see it, your iols in there and you're going to think man that was a bit tough you know it's really hard i'm you know do i really want to try more surgery what if they have a problem um, you just want to get out of the OR like as quick as possible. That you gotta resist that temptation, and you have to say no, no, no. What's going to be better is leaving this perfect. And so that, so yeah, so one measure, two pressure, three. If it's not good, redo it. Amazing. Thanks very much. Can I just ask out of it? Maybe, maybe I missed it. What What's your average thickness for your ultra thin disc? What What thickness do you achieve? For us? So I actually, so I actually don't order. I just are, we're very lucky that we have an eye bank that will pre-cut tissue and I don't really have much say in what shows up in the OR in the morning. Um, you know, sometimes we get, we, we have a day and we we're doing four DMEX and we have four pre-stripped DMEX and other days we have an OR and we get, a, I get a text message from the eye bank person the day before saying, uh, so I've sent you two corneas. Neither is great. You can either peel a, 40 year old or a 60 year old with diabetes, you choose. So I don't know what's going to be there. It's always fun. So for the D sex, it's the same thing. We've had graphs that are, you know, 48 microns and we've had graphs that are 135. Um, I would not call 135 ultra thin, but I would say our average graft is somewhere between 80 and 110. So I, the thinner, the better. Um, I will say though, that if you're going to do a really complex eye, and, you know, that's the eye where if the graft is 130, like, let's be honest, it's not the end of the world, right? But of course, who doesn't want a thinner graft, right? Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Great. So, I don't know if Mr. Hamara would like to ask anything. No, I just would like to thank them for very interesting and, as I said, relevant, because actually, the cases you presented, this is a case I think most corneal surgeons will, will see and face, and there's a lot of challenges. So it was really relevant. I really thank you for your time and for this amazing uh, talk and the presentation. Great videos. Great surgery. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And Nizar, I want to I jump in and say thank you as well for, uh, for presenting these super well. Great, great job, man. All right. Thank you, thank you both for, uh, for the invitation. Thank you all for the invitation. It's, it's our honor to have you tonight. And I think, Nizar, you said that you have a, a video library. Which yeah, so I, I alluded to earlier. So um, last year in the pandemic, we created a video library, corneasurgery.ca. That's the website. Little plug for us here in Toronto. 
Um, so it's got like various um, uh, skills. So DMEG, DSEX, the whole library and we're trying to populate that even more. So uh, feel free, you know, we're just trying to expand the knowledge, share the knowledge. Um, so feel free. I'll, I'll type it in the chat box if you want. Yeah, that's um, great. Thank you. Yeah, please do that. Amazing. So thank you both very much. I think we took a lot of your time today. And uh, the you. were amazing. The, the, your comments were amazing as well. So I'd just like to thank everyone, thank our audience for watching and remind you that we're coming back next month on the 10th of November, Wednesday again, with Professor Damien Gatinel this time. And so please save the date and we're looking forward to seeing you then. So goodbye everyone. Have a nice evening or whatever time, you, <laughs> time zone you're at, okay. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, thank, thank you again. Bye. Take care, thank you.